The catastrophes described in ancient sources were traumatic experiences common to all mankind. Purged from conscious memory, these records are now interpreted as allegories, metaphors, and the trauma has been submerged in the unconscious. Velikovsky calls this collective amnesia. I'm Mark Starovich. On this edition of Documentary CBC, a theory about our solar system that sent a scholar on a collision course with mainstream science. It can be thought of as a sort of billiard shot in the heavens. Less than 4,000 years ago, Venus jumps out of its orbit, past Earth, knocks Mars out of its orbit, and causes general chaos. Did it happen? Dr. Emanuel Velikovsky thought so, based on various ancient texts. In the 1950s, he was considered a kook. But since then, some of his predictions have turned out to be true. Less than a decade before his death, the CBC profiled him. From the program Tuesday night in 1972, here is Velikovsky. <laughs> A revolutionary theory of the universe based on the records of the past has challenged the fundamental beliefs of modern science for more than two decades. Today, the unexpected findings of space explorations have confirmed many of the predictions of this theory, but the man who proposed it, Emanuel Velikovsky, is still rejected by established science. Well, I've taken a lot, but they're not very good. You're in too close for most of them. And if I trans transgressed and went into many fields of science and humanities, it was not because I was born a rebel. I was coerced to trespass. The belief that we are living in an orderly universe, that nothing happened to this Earth and the other planets since the beginning, that nothing will happen till the end, is a wishful thinking that fills the textbooks and your textbooks are still of Victorian vintage. Is any physicist here who would stand up and defend the proposition that only gravitation and inertia are in action in the solar system? But of all my heresies, this was the greatest. And let me ask you another question. Is the theory of uniformitarianism, which means that nothing what happens but happened in the past could have happened if it doesn't happen today? And this is built the modern geology. And this is built the modern astronomy. And this is built the modern biology and theory of evolution. And so, it is only wishful thinking that we are living in a safe, never perturbed solar system and a safe never perturbed, perturbed us.
Mountains were born and mountains collapsed. Land and sea changed places. Great streams of lava flowed. The sea boiled and evaporated. Such were the scenes of unimaginable violence during the times of global catastrophe. In Worlds in Collision, Velikovsky describes the last two acts of this cosmic drama as recorded by the ancients. At the time of Moses, 34 centuries ago, a giant comet, which later became the planet Venus, nearly collided with the Earth. On two occasions, the Earth passed through the tail of this comet and experienced intense heating and enormous tides, incessant electric discharges, and rains of hot stones and a deluge of fire. Velikovsky claims that some of the oil deposits originated with the hydrocarbons in the comet's tail. This is also the source of manna that sustained the Hebrews after the exodus from Egypt. Here in the New York Herald Tribune, uh, explosion in science, the artist's conception of what, uh, of what happened when the uh, uh, heavens burst. Um, what happened uh, during the 1500 B.C. Uh, upheaval, which uh, we read about in the Bible as the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and the uh, phenomena or upheaval that, uh, that accompanied that. And this is the artist's conception of what happened in Palestine and Mexico and China. Lightning meteorites being rained down as the comet's head came closer to the earth, uh, followed by floods. Same in Mexico, where water swept over the entire land, great gigantic tides. In a final collision with Mars, the comet lost the remnants of its tail and became transformed into the planet Venus. Now Mars traveled on an erratic orbit, and in the year 687 BC, it nearly collided with the Earth. There were repeated changes in the Earth's orbit in the lengths of day, the seasons, and the year. In these catastrophes, entire species of animals were annihilated. Others proliferated from wholesale mutations. Mankind was decimated. Civilizations destroyed. In Velikovsky's world, the heavens are a huge arena where giant comets are born. Planets collide and huge sparks, thunderbolts, leap between heavenly bodies. The whole idea of the recentness of cataclysmic events in this part of the universe, the whole idea of catastrophe in the use of science and its base upon an, its being based on an orderly evolution of things, were very shocking ideas to the high priests of the beautiful symmetry of reason and the natural progression of it. He knocked out a a, a very strong prop for an obsolete form of science, which is what surprised me about the violence of the reaction, since I would have thought that scientists themselves had, had long ago left this behind, and that is, is New Newtonian science, the science which relies on order uh, and, and a very simple kind of order. God, the geometrician, the, the clockwork universe that just was wound up at some moment in the distant past and now ticks away in its regular fashion. That, that he attacked, but on the other hand, he <laughs> was long gone before, before he said anything about it. His, his notion that there could Eric Larrabee, have been unique director of the New York State Council of the Arts. Is a As an editor of Harper's Magazine, he wrote an article on Velikovsky in 1950, in just prior to the publication of Worlds in Collision. One, one of the surprising things about the pressure that the scientific and scholarly community brought to bear is that it succeeded. The, the book, Wor the Worlds in Collision then, merely the first of the books, had been on the top of the bestseller list for something like 11 weeks. And nonetheless, the publisher was so uh, mortally wounded, is on the only word, by the 
the uh, turning away of salesmen from the doors of, of professors' studies and all of the implications that went with this, that the book was transferred to another publisher which was willing to take it over, which, after all, is a fairly extraordinary thing in publishing. Not only was the scientific press copying at him, and in a way that was violent, not in terms of an orderly discussion that this idea is yet to be tested and it takes more time and etc but saying this idea is crazy and any man who has such an idea is mad insane that kind of thing but the establishment through which men who think that way make a living the academic establishment was saying to this man you know you're not safe now in the case of most of the young being themselves unhappily Dr. Birenbaum, president of Staten Island Community College. In the case of Velikovsky, there is something hard, and the cost of being himself has been very, very great. That is a condition to which I think the young profitably can be exposed. And if I had my way, every young undergraduate student in my college, every one, whether he's in the humanities or the hard sciences, would be required to examine the Velikovsky case. First, because the subject matter of what the man is standing for is very interesting. Very, very interesting. Secondly, because the subject matter is truly interdisciplinary. It's stretching. But third, because the human embodiment of the expression of the ideas, in a way, is symbolic of the problem the young think they are facing in this kind of a society, and which, in my opinion, they, in fact, are facing. Not only them, me. But well, what is this condition? The problem, the condition is the extreme professionalization and rigidification of institutions through which thought is supposed to occur. Extreme to the point where it begins to contaminate the fluidity and looseness, the freedom to think. Fluidity and looseness of ideas, of having ideas, and the freedom to think. And Velikovsky really wasn't taken on by the establishment simply because of what he was saying. He was also taken on by the establishment, in my opinion, because of his audacity in having such thoughts. The man... Yeah, go away, we got a sticker. Good security voice here. <laughs> uh, the thing about Velikovsky is that the ideas are so much a part of the man, have been so hammered into his own personality by the controversy, that the ideas, the ideas themselves are his life. And this man is a fighter for life. He is a fighter for life. He's not going to be bowled over if they all say no. He's not going to give up life. And, and the survival of the ideas now are so much wrapped up with the survival of the man. And that's what makes for the bravery that we spoke of earlier. Emanuel Velikovsky was born June 10, 1895, in Vitebsk, Russia. After receiving a medical degree from the University of Moscow in 1921, he practiced for a time in Palestine. Following a period of study in Vienna, he specialized in psychoanalysis. In 1939, Velikovsky came to New York to pursue research on Freud's three heroes, Oedipus, Akhenaten, and Moses, first idea that probably moved me into this direction on which I followed since then was the realization that during the exodus occurred natural happenings, you can call catastrophes, which are reflected in the story of the plagues in the story of the crossing of the sea, in the story of the rumbling mountain from which they heard the Decalogue. And the travel in the desert, the wandering in the desert, well, covered with ash and some strange phenomena of food falling from the sky. If anything of this really happened, good chances would be that 
something would be also found in Egyptian story, in some Egyptian documents. In the books of Egyptology, you find nothing about the catastrophe in this, during the long history of Egyptian people. So it was after a document of this nature that I went. And after several weeks, I could establish that a certain document, a papyrus, written by a sage by name Ipuwea, a papyrus stored since early part of the 19th century in the University Museum or University Library of Leiden in Holland is exactly a story of the plagues described by an Egyptian eyewitness. So here I had a synchronical point, synchronical point between two histories, biblical and Egyptian. The papyrus of Ipawer synchronized biblical and Egyptian events and led to a reconstruction of ancient history. Many questions debated for centuries found an answer. In the Bible, the identity of the beautiful Queen of Sheba at the court of Solomon was unknown. In Egyptian records, the land of Punt, visited by Queen Hatshepsut, could not be determined. In Velikovsky's reconstruction, it is clear that Punt is the land of Solomon and Hatshepsut is the Queen of Sheba. The biblical story of Joshua, with the sun standing still in Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon, presented another realization. I was struck by the fact that two lines or two verses before the story of the sun and moon disturbed in their daily motion was the story of large stones that fell from the sky and destroyed more of the enemy soldiers than the sword of the Israelite. On this combination, because combination of stones and disturbance in rotation of the earth, the ancient could not know that it was the earth that was disturbed in rotation. They thought the moon and the sun made me immediately to follow the path toward east and west. And I found without great difficulty that in Western Hemisphere, which means here on this continent, <coughs> the story persists too. The story persists among the Redskins, it persisted among the Mayas, at the time when the continent was first conquered, the Mexico part of it, by the Spaniards, namely that the sun was rising just over the eastern horizon when it dropped back and came a little up again and stand there without motion, and all the forests burned. Again, the Redskin could not know about the heat resulting from disturbance in the Earth's rotation. So, of course, this would be not enough. You had to go to all civilization to Japan, to China, to India, to Persia, to Babylonia, to Assyria, to Asia Minor, to Greece, to Rome, to Judea, to Egypt, to Mexico, to Peru, to Iceland, and for oral transmission, even to East Indies. And the same story could have been found in all places, but 
differently told so that it was no question of just borrowing from one nation by another. So this was, was the position, the story of human memory of catastrophes that took place in historical times, but strangely, despite the fact that they were described in so many sources, as if non-existent for the scientific world. According to the earlier records, the origin of the Great Flood is Saturn, which was referred to by the ancients as a water planet. And we have information in Midrashic sources that two filaments, I wouldn't like to say comets, filaments of erupted mass from Saturn reached the Earth and engulfed it in the age. How much water fell? Enough to fill Atlantic Ocean. And what, what was the water that fell? What was it like? I always liked that. Water? The water that fell in the flood, what was it like? It was salty. What else can I say? It was a little warm described. It was salty. It was not really hot. Other ancient documents tell of the thunderbolts of the planet god Jupiter. Velikovsky understood that these thunderbolts referred to electromagnetic discharges between planets. This led to his claim that radio noises must emanate from Jupiter. In 1955, radio noises from Jupiter were discovered. It was this prediction and discovery that finally convinced Einstein of the merit of Velikovsky's ideas. I knew Einstein since 1921 or 22. At that time, I came from Russia just after I obtained my medical degree. Einstein was already a famous man, actually in the prime of his fame. My idea was to bring together the Jewish scholars and scientists from various disciplines and from various countries in one work which I call Scripta Universitatis. It has a longer title. This was my beginning with Einstein. I was the general editor. He was the editor of mathematics and physics. We met again in this country and uh, in 1940, again in 1946, but a real debate started soon after I moved to Princeton in 1952. And for 18 months, we discussed one subject, always the very same subject. And the point in the debate, always the same, was whether electrical and magnetic fields are participating in the celestial mechanism, or only gravitation and inertia, as he would claim, because this was the view not only of his, but of all scientific community. And so this was a debate. At one point in that debate, I offered in a letter in June of 1954 to stake our positions on a claim that I made that Jupiter sends out radio noises. And if you wish, I said, it will be easy to find out. He wrote his comments on the margin, as usual. Nine days before his death, but he was in good state yet, he wished to see me. I brought the news. I brought the news that... 
uh, that um, this was discovered. Radio noises were discovered by chance, and those who discovered them to scientists of Washington, D.C., for weeks and weeks could not establish from where the noises came. There's also about some terrestrial origin, some neighboring station disturbance. Finally, they had to, you know, to come to the conclusion that it was from t extraterrestrial source, and namely, after more deliberation, from Jupiter. My wife was always present during those meetings, and after he died, she made the picture that you see on the wall. My wife was actually a sculptor, and she exhibited in the Metropolitan Museum and uh, Whitney Museum Universe, and the uh, Museum of uh, Pennsylvania, mm, Art Museum, many other places, got first prizes. But uh, she was endowed with two talents. One is a violinist, chamber musician, and the other is a sculptor. This prediction and confirmation of radio noises from Jupiter convinced Einstein to seek crucial experiments on Velikovsky's ideas. After Einstein's death, his estate wrote letters to this effect, but with no result. Later on, when I felt, and I, I know Dr. Velikovsky felt, that a very considerable amount of, of evidence had piled up, which was very helpful, to put it mildly, to his side. And the resistance of the, of the professional journals to taking all this seriously was still as great as it had been at the start. And I felt also myself a degree of obligation. I wanted to, I wanted to pay my respects to him and I wanted to pay my, some of my intellectual debt to him. And so I, I uh, wrote and Harper's accepted the, the second article attempting to bring people up to date and give some of the items that had come along. As late as 1959, the surface temperature of Venus was calculated to be roughly the same as that of the Earth. But in 1962, the Mariner probes to Venus found it to be 800 degrees Fahrenheit. The probes also found hydrocarbons in the atmosphere of Venus. In 1946, Velikovsky had stated these two tests, the heat of Venus and the presence of hydrocarbons, to be crucial to his idea that Venus is a newcomer to the solar system. Now, my line of thought was this. Venus erupted from Jupiter only several thousand years ago. Jupiter, by the way, is 400 times heavier than Venus. It is, and so it was the natal heat. And then the change of motion into heat when Venus traveling on a extended ellipse met on its way other celestial bodies twice meeting the Earth. And electrical discharges also took place between Venus and other celestial bodies, even its parental body, Jupiter. These and other causes, radioactivity that was endangered, engendered, resulted in heat. And Venus was observed by the ancient as a very brilliant incandescent body, rivaling the sun in its brightness. So it is also described by the Chinese, by the Babylonians, by the Mexicans. I claim that it must be close to incandescent. And finally, 11 years after World the Collision was published, after the radio noises were observed coming from Jupiter, other planets were 
um, investigated on radio signals. And the radio signals coming from Venus were found, but of different nature, of thermal nature, indicating that Venus is hot. It was unbelieved, and therefore the main task of Mariner 2, Mariner first one didn't succeed, of Mariner 2 in December 1962 was to find out whether Venus is really hot. At that time, it was found that it is something like 600 degrees, and the announcement was made that it's most probably a mistaken re result. But at that time I wrote that uh, most probably it will be found more than 600. And uh, truly, a few months later, it was announced it is 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and today it's already found that it's over 900 degrees Fahrenheit on the bottom, under the clouds. Okay. A temperature at which many metals are molten. Following the confirmations of the Mariner probes, Velikovsky brought the success of his predictions to the attention of the scientific community. Dr. Motz, Department of Astronomy at Columbia, is a past president of the New York Academy of Science. After Velikovsky had come to me, I agreed to write a letter to science delineating his statements, his discoveries, stating that Venus would be found to be very hot, that radio emanations would be found coming from Jupiter, and a number of other things that we specified in the letter. So Dr. Bargman and I did indeed write that letter to science, indicating that regardless of whether one believed this to have stemmed from Velikovsky's theory, his prior rights to the discovery ought to be recognized. And, that, and then we indicated that we did not accept his theory as such, but we did accept his discoveries, see. After we had written the letter, the argument was started again, and people did write to me saying that I perhaps should not have done this because clearly saying that Velikovsky had announced these things did not specify the truth of his arguments. And I indicated that I felt that a person who had made an announcement what indicated certain things ought to be given, given credit for these things. Do you feel these are very unusual statements to have come true? Yes, they are very unusual because nobody suspected that Venus would be as hot as it was found to be. And people had no reason to suppose that radio waves would come from Jupiter and uh, that these other things would be found to be so, or the carbohydrates that are thought to be on Venus and things of that sort. So why did these other scientists feel that this was not proper on your part? Well, because uh, they felt it uh, would lend support to what they thought was an irrational theory, you see. As a matter of fact, uh, there's nothing irrational about the theory. It is just, uh, Velikovsky does not depart from accepted scientific arguments and scientific theories. It's just that there's no evidence that his ideas apply to this situation at all. You see, that is the point. What he was saying ran against what the high priests of the disciplines thought was the best evidence of the time. In the areas, the areas of his probe involved sectors where best evidence itself was questionable. What was best evidence in those areas? You cannot get a body to do what he says Venus did without altering entirely the distribution of masses in the solar system. The solar system is an extremely stable system. You can't make Venus go change from one orbit to another in that way. The sun dominates, the sun is at the center, and therefore there's a regularity that cannot be uh, altered. When I was born intellectually, reason reigned supreme at the University of Chicago. Even after World War II and Hitler, the answer to everything was man's mind. And the beautiful part of being a student at the University of Chicago then was the feeling that nothing was beyond the thought of man, and no problem was beyond his rational solution. Uh, Twenty years ago, I thought you could persuade people. And now, I'm again and again, I think of that 
terrible remark of Max Planck's that you, you don't persuade people of anything. With the, the believers in the old ideas die off one after another. <laughs> That's all that happens. It's, it's a very sad experience how little attention people pay to, to what one would think is convincing evidence. is a silent record of the past. According to Velikovsky, its features are evidence for the disruptions of the solar system. In fine layers, uh, like uh, powdered charcoal, to the, uh, to the skull and inside of my boot. Yeah, the original publications that were coming out of NASA, however, were indicating that it's probably been quite some time since there was water on the moon. There's a rather recent one, however, that uh, is put out by Dr. Agrell of Cambridge University, who has found some rust in some of the rocks that were found on the moon. This indicates that at least at some time, water was either on the moon, indigenous to the moon, perhaps, or... The water, according to Velikovsky, should have come from a an earlier catastrophe uh, involving the planet Saturn. Dr. David Carlyle, research associate at the University of Texas. He is a director of Cosmos and Kronos, a Velikovsky study group, along with a physicist at General Dynamics, Dr. C.J. Ransom. ...was a type of cosmic cloud of water through which the Earth and the Moon both past at the same time, thereby depositing water within the last less than 10,000 years on the moon, and there should be evidence of this water having been there. We felt uh, that something of Velikovsky's prognoses concerning the findings on the moon should be made available to a much wider audience than it had been uh, available to, and so we prepared a bulletin which we published uh, under the title of the Cosmos and Kronos Moon Bulletin, and we set down a number of the claims that had, had been made by Velikovsky concerning uh, what he felt would be found on the moon, and we lined these up with some of the findings that had actually been reported so far. Although the lunar experiments were not designed to test Velikovsky's claims, all but one of his predictions have been confirmed. The lunar rocks were found to have magnetic remnants. Before the first landing, Velikovsky had suggested that the rocks be marked in their place so that their orientation could be determined. But this was not carried out because scientists expected no magnetic remnants. Other findings that Velikovsky predicted, numerous moonquakes, traces of hydrocarbons or their derivatives, carbides, excessive neon and argon, radioactivity of the lunar material, and a heat outflow from under the lunar surface. All these findings present problems to orthodox scientists who have proposed conflicting explanations. But the scientists all accept the evidence of the dating experiments for the last melting of the lunar material. The results vary from three to five and one half billion years. Velikovsky contends that the moon was last molten less than 3,000 years ago, when Mars was in close approach. 
perhaps as long as the moon itself. Well, the moon is also a, a much smaller body than the Earth, and because it has uh, much less mass than, than our planet does, it would be uh, affected much more greatly by the uh, close approach of Mars or anybody than the Earth would. Uh, the moon had two bodies essentially fighting over it at this time, and uh, this created a tremendous uh, problem with tidal frictions and things like this that led to the heating of the, of the surface, and under the heating, it's much more susceptible to, to bubbles, of course, or to uh, craters, large impact craters, and various other things like this that gave origin to its features. There's a very important fact here, too, concerning the Earth, especially since the time of the space program's initiation. Nobody felt that the Earth was a very extensively cratered planet. Uh, we know now that Mars looks very much like the moon. Little fresh one. Little fresh. Boy, look at that. Very angular flags all over the thing. Yeah, we passed uh, several of those. Uh, Roger, our TV pan suggests you can go straight for St. George Crater and you'll find Elbow OK. And uh, we're suggesting you omit checkpoint one. Prisling Crater should be a good landmark along the way. And head 208. Over. OK, 208, Joe. There's no commonly accepted uh, method by which the carbon that has been found on the moon could have gotten there. Uh, we have the picture of the Earth and the moon passing through the tail of Venus and the carbon, carbonaceous compounds pouring down on it. On the moon, these would, through subsequent heating uh, and irradiation, be changed into less complex forms of carbon, such as carbides or carbonates. This is uh, what was expected in the picture that we've been discussing. Uh, there are any number of directions we can go in talking about carbon from here. And the rain of carbon or petroleum products can really come about in a couple of ways. Oro and Hahn have recently published an article in Science Magazine in which they mention various possibilities as to the interaction of a comet and a planet producing hydrocarbons and they could have also already been in the comet tail and so either mechanism could have dumped them on the earth what stage is in our basket 99 pro Uh, we have a very interesting possibility now that, that in our cars we, we drive with power that came to us or energy that came to us uh, only a few hundred centuries ago from Venus. Uh, we understand more now because of the fact that we can change oil into edible materials, how the Israelites might have been able to eat manna uh, that was in, perhaps in some way oil changed into an edible form by bacteria. Uh, we have some explanation now for the rivers of milk and honey flowing that uh, Velikovsky uh, pointed out as being an indication of hydrocarbons uh, in worlds in collision uh, some 25 years ago almost now. So. Warner Sizemore, assistant professor of philosophy and religion at Glassborough College. Actually, there's so many facts that support uh, Velikovsky's theories. Uh, it's hard to know where to begin. Uh, we could just pick up from here and there some simple facts and, and, and look at them. For example, the, uh, the moons of Mars, decades before they were discovered with the aid of a telescope. Jonathan Swift uh, wrote about them. 
Um, Velikovsky suggests possibly that he had use of sources that are no longer extant, uh, which reflect the fact that ancient man was able to see them simply because the orbit of Mars was different due to these great upheavals of uh, the solar system, which drove Mars uh, closer to the Earth in its encounter with Venus. Uh, these moons of Mars were seen with, by the ancient men with the unaided eye with the, uh, the use of a telescope. One of the most interesting cases that uh, are these uh, mammoths that are frozen in the uh, Yukon or in Alaska, frozen in the muck and the gravel of uh, that area that uh, still have food in their mouths. Uh, the flesh uh, is, has been preserved in the, uh, in the ice so that actually when they were dug out, when they were digging for gold, uh, they could actually feed the, uh, the flesh of these animals to, to sledge dogs. Whatever happened, uh, happened suddenly, as, for example, the tilting of the axis of the earth and uh, freezing them right there uh, where, where they were found just a few years ago. One of the interesting questions that uh, Velikovsky's work uh, raises for the study of religion reopens the question which a lot of scholars are no longer too interested in, that is the uh, origin of, of religion. Uh, there are various theories, but uh, Velikovsky uh, opens the question again as to the possible astral origin. Why did the ancients uh, worship uh, stars or planets that uh, the average person can't pick out of the sky today? And yet, uh, all of our uh, ancient heritage that comes to us in terms of architecture, uh, writing, and so on, they're, they're actually obsessed with, uh, with the idea of worshiping these stars, these dreaded planets. Uh, all mankind uh, through the years have uh, uh, worshipped uh, stars that we can't even pick out of the sky today. Now why? Why were they so obsessed with them? Unless in some way uh, these stars uh, were threats to them, uh, in some way impressed themselves upon uh, ancient man. The catastrophes described in ancient sources were traumatic experiences common to all mankind. Purged from conscious memory, these records are now interpreted as allegories, metaphors, and the trauma has been submerged in the unconscious. Velikovsky calls this collective amnesia. A book like Old Testament is read maybe more than any other book through the centuries. It's translated to all languages. And you read there about sea and unchanging places, about mountain moving into the sea, mountain being overturned, mountain melting like wax. And you think that this is metaphors. And so it is the phenomenon that Freud stressed and stressed again of the role of traumatic experience on the life of an individual. But he stressed also another point, namely, that the victim of this partial amnesia lives under the urge to repeat the traumatic experience, sometimes changing roles, making somebody else the victim. And mankind today, advanced enough in technology, produced the nuclear weapons that could be like symbol or something representing the ancient violent celestial body that through fire and smoke disturbed the rotation of the earth. Now if man is under the urge to repeat the ancient catastrophic events, the ancient trauma, are we not in a predicament? It is not a preaching to be better. It is a preaching to know yourself. What uh, do you think uh, is the effect of this collective amnesia 
in the future. The effect is very great, not only in the future, it was also in the past. Because as long as a man doesn't remember his past, he acts as a neurotic, a person who suffered a traumatic experience. Due to this traumatic experience, suffered also an amnesia, a local amnesia, so to say, not spread off through all his personality. But in this case, in the human race, we have something that is comparable with a single personality that suffered a trauma. You undertake to psychoanalyze mankind as a whole. You realize that it's not easy to put uh, the entire mankind on the couch. But uh, all what I can do is publish the psychological aspect of these events of which I spoke from biological and paleontological side in uh, person of evil, from folkloristic size in worlds and collision, from archaeological side in ages and years. Are there any rituals uh, that we are practicing now which would seem to uh, uh, indicate a repetition of this uh, trauma? Not only any ritual, almost all rituals in religions, in uh, various religions, all our observation in some way go back to the astral religion, to the beginnings that are rooted in the catastrophic events of the past. And I think there's one question that runs through the mind, if not obsesses the minds of your readers, and that is, when can we expect the next catastrophe? And what I'd like to ask you is, how does the sky look to you? I was asked this question almost at the end of every lecture. We are now living in a solar system in which between the planetary bodies, the astral gods of all ancient religions. There exists now there a peaceful peace, a harmony, peaceful coexistence. But it is the man himself, human mind, that is not released from the bones of the past. He lives in a world that he created himself in his arrogance, in his violence, in his misunderstanding of what happened in the past, so he is irrational. Belikovsky arrived at his understanding that the origin of man's irrational behavior is rooted in the traumas of the past. And once again, the violence of the ancient gods was reflected in world events. So, it was a tragic time and I was... I could do nothing. I could only immerse myself into the books that spoke of ancient times and two words came out of it actually we were born six months apart in the spring of 1940 ages and chaos and six months later was in collision 
And then I knew already that I will have to stay long here. I knew also that my work will find quite an opposition, but I did not know the extent, the extent of this opposition and the violence. But time has creative power. The very fact that you came today to take those pictures and the mail of today and of yesterday proves that even in science, falsehood cannot live for too long. <laughs>